brothers, uh, they were probably both alike and different. We know that we, they both had um, work they did with their hands in order to cultivate and grow. But for Cain, as a farmer, he was cultivating growth out of the ground. Whereas for Abel, as a shepherd, he was cultivating the growth of his flock of sheep. At some point, the time comes where it's appropriate to make an offering to God. And so Cain and Abel come before God. We don't get much detailed description of Cain's offering. And so we might safely assume that the basket of fruits and vegetables is not noteworthy. It's pretty average. But we get descriptors for Abel's offering. His sheep that he brings forth are fat and firstlings. In other words, the first and the best that he's got. God likes Abel's offering. God dislikes Cain's offering. Cain is angry. God gives Cain a warning. He tells Cain that he can't sulk in this. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain doesn't take God's advice. Cain lures Abel out into his field all by themselves, and he kills his brother. God comes to Cain and says, where's Abel? And Cain answers famously, what, am I my brother's keeper? But God knows what's up. God knows that the ground that Cain is supposed to cultivate for growth and life instead has soaked up the blood of his dead brother. And that blood is crying out to God. This is the story of the first siblings. It seems sibling rivalry was a factor from the very beginning. But I wonder if it could have gone differently. And certainly if there had been no Abel, this story would be different. In that case, then Adam and Eve have one son, and his name is Cain, and he's a farmer, and he works hard from sunup to sundown to get the land to grow. The time comes for an offering, and Cain comes before God with his average basket of fruits and vegetables, and God dislikes Cain's offering. So Cain is angry, and he goes off to the field to sulk. But he has no one to blame but himself. There's no other brother to look at, to compare himself to. So instead, he's forced just to look at his basket of fruit and reevaluate. And as he looks at it, he realizes the truth. That he left at home on purpose that state fair prize winning zucchini, right? And the big, beautiful tomato without a bruise on it. This is just an average basket of the medium fare. So the time comes again for Cain to bring an offering. And this time, this time he brings a virtual cornucopia of fruit, the best that he's got. God likes Cain's offering. God is happy. Cain is happy. All is well. It's dangerous when we start comparing ourselves to others, isn't it? And as a parent of two siblings, I know this truth. I have Eleanor, who's almost six, and Reed, who is three. And Reed loves to run. Some of you have seen this in action at Thursday night welcome table dinners. He will just run laps around the church, and then we go home, and he runs laps around our house. We just got him a new pair of sneakers, and he calls them his fast, 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 fast shoes. <laughs> he loves to run. It gives him joy. When he runs, he feels fast. And for a three-year-old, he is pretty fast. Now, Eleanor is less inclined to running, but she does have an eye for competition. So every now and 
and then the four of us are playing outside, and the two siblings will goad us into a race. Alan and I are supposed to stand at one spot and mark the start and finish, and hopefully they would prefer with flags we can wave NASCAR style, right? <laughs> so we oblige, we do this, but we know what's going to happen. We stand there and we say, ready, set, go. And they both take off with equal passion, but inevitably, Eleanor pulls ahead. It's just physics. Her legs are longer. She's going to win. And whenever she passes Reed, as the scripture for today would put it, his countenance falls. <laughs> In other words, he flings himself to the ground and wails. And the thing that gave him such great joy when there was no one else to compare with becomes the source of despair. Comparing ourselves to others can be dangerous business. But not all the time. This is kind of the trick. Sometimes it helps, it's encouraging to compare ourselves to others. It motivates us. So Alan, for my birthday, gave me one of these things. It's called a Fitbit. Some of you have one. It counts how many steps you take in any given day. And somehow, the American Heart Association has come up with a goal of 10,000 steps a day, or about five miles. And whenever you hit 10,000 steps, or whatever your goal is, it will give this happy little vibrate to let you know that you've made it. So already, after about a month of wearing it, I'm like a Pavlovian dog. I mean, I will walk laps around our yard in order to get it to buzz for me, and then I feel good I've made my goal. The real genius of this thing, though, is that you can link it with other people who have one. So I have some friends who also have a Fitbit, and we agree to be friends through the software, and it ranks us every week, every day, actually, of who's had the most steps in the last seven days. Now, some of you know me, and you know that I'm a bit competitive. Some of you know me, and you know that I like to walk a lot. So you might be thinking, oh, Pastor Mary, I bet she's number one on her rank. No. <laughs> Never. And I'll tell you exactly why, and his name is Michael. <laughs> We've been friends since we were little kids, and we also love to compete with each other, kind of like siblings. Michael takes not 10,000, not 15,000, but 20,000 steps every day. Wow. Who, who can compete with that? <laughs> Well, I can try, I can testify to that. And the first week that I had this thing, I walked myself into an exhaustion trying to keep up with my goal. It is not possible. I don't know how he's doing this. He's shaking it. <laughs> he's shaking it, Margie says. <laughs> he's cheating. <laughs> he's a new director. How is he doing it? So, but here's the thing, here's what I've noticed. I have never once, not once, wanted to lure Michael into a lonely field and kill him <laughs> in order to off my competition. <laughs> and on a more realistic level, I've not harbored any ill feelings for Michael. No jealousy, no envy, no anger, nothing. Instead, it's only been positive. I mean, we rib each other a little bit, but it's motivated me. If Michael hadn't been on my little friend list with Frit Fitbit, I would have been pretty satisfied with 10,000 steps. I would have even felt smug with my 10,000 steps. But because I see what he's doing, I've raised my own standard for myself. It's motivated me to do better. So sometimes, sometimes comparison is bad, even deadly. But sometimes comparison is good. It's helpful. And this is in part what our Methodist church is built on. John Wesley is the guy who started a Methodist movement. He lived in the 1700s. And he started it largely with small groups, accountability groups. 
who would meet at least weekly and compare the state of their souls. And so we can do for our spiritual health the same thing this does for our physical health. We can share how much we're reading the Bible or praying, how much we're helping the poor or looking out for others, and that comparison can motivate us. I can see your example and raise myself up to it. So why is comparison bad sometimes and so good other times? Well, let's think about Cain and Abel again. And I think there's another way their story could have gone differently. Cain and Abel were the first brothers, the two sons of Adam and Eve. Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a shepherd. And the time comes for them to bring their offerings before God. And Cain brings his average-looking basket of fruit and vegetables, and Abel brings his fat firstlings from his flock. And God likes Abel's offering, but dislikes Cain's offering. And Cain is angry. But God gives Cain his warning. And Cain goes off to sulk in his field, but then reluctantly considers what God has said. And the more he focuses on God, the more he gains a kind of clarity, an objective perspective. And he thinks about how God would view his basket. And then he thinks again about Abel. He remembers Abel's gift, but this time it's in light of what God would think. And this time, it helps him to see that Abel has brought the first and best, and Cain has not. Cain's anger breaks, and he resolves to do different. The time comes again for Cain to bring an offering, and Abel too. And they come before God, and typically Abel has his fat first wings from his flock, but this time, Cain has that beautiful cornucopia of fruit, bright and shiny, the very best he has to offer. God likes Abel's offering. God likes Cain's offering, too. Everyone is happy. All is well. I think the trick to comparison is where our ultimate focus lies. If we're building our self-worth on how we rank among others, then inevitably that comparison is going to degrade into jealousy and envy and hatred and anger. It will. But if our self-worth is firmly rooted in what God thinks of us, in God's love for us that is unchanging and eternal, then we can let the comparison motivate us instead of degrade us. I think it works like this for runners, or at least some runners. I think of the Olympic champion Eric Liddell. They made that movie um, Chariots of Fire about him, right? And um, he's, there's this great quote that's attributed to him. I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. You know too, Lisa. Runners like Eric Liddell, they run because that's what God has created them to do. They run to do their best for God. And I feel confident that Eric Liddell was aware of the competition. He knew who to compare himself to, who might be running ahead or falling behind. But with his focus on God and doing the best for what God has made him to do, then those comparisons only motivated him to pick up his own pace instead of motivating him to hate the other runners. God has given us a race to run in life as well. And like a good runner, we can stay focused on the finish line where our Creator God is waiting with arms open <coughs> wide and unconditional love everlasting. <coughs> And as we run this race, we might notice from time to time how our position varies. We might see that someone has run out ahead of us or fallen behind us, and we should notice that. But with our eyes focused on God, then we can be motivated to pick up our own pace.
or to reach back and help someone in need. Never out of anger or jealousy or hate, but rooted in God's love for all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ who are working together toward the same end. Amen. <laughs>